Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's Quill Conversation on Digital Storytelling Through Interactive Video with Dr. Erica Smithwick. Dr. Smithwick is an Associate Professor of Geography here at Penn State University. She's also the Director of the Center for Landscape Dynamics. She has served as a Fulbright Research and Teaching Scholar in South Africa last spring at the Rhodes University. And Erica received the COIL Research Initiative Grant in 2015 for interactive video and online learning. She's going to share some information with us today about that project. Great, thank you. And Stephanie was a part of that project. So. Yeah, great project. Um, well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm actually quite excited to share uh, this work. Um, in many ways, this work connects my research world and my teaching world. Um, and so I'm really excited to try to share some of that. I probably um, have too many research slides that I'm going to go quickly through because I want to emphasize the application. But I do want to give you that context because I think it's pretty important. It's how I'm, I ended up here today. Hi, yeah, come on in. So what I'd like to first quickly discuss is, is an overview of what we mean by interactivity um, and how it's used currently in teaching and learning. Then to talk about how, I, how the evolution of this idea to use interactive learning in an online program evolved for me through my research, um, through a study abroad program in, in South Africa and a number of other, other projects as well. And then talk about how I'm thinking about interactive video and online and blended classes across several phases of development. And as I was actually counting them up um, in preparing this talk, I realized there was essentially five phases of development uh, for, for making this happen. So it was, it was certainly a long time in coming. So um, the, the work that I'm going to talk about, I think, touches on what I'm calling a cornucopia of themes. Uh, it is related to topics of engaged scholarship, because I'm talking about how to connect um, scholarship in a study abroad course to residential learning. So I'm trying to think about how to bring engaged scholarship into the classroom, uh, online and residential, I should say. It touches upon digital storytelling. Um, how do you use videos in a storytelling mode? Uh, an area that I'm learning about now, not coming in as, as trained in education, but I, I do believe that it, it touches on ideas of metacognition and cognitive en engagement. How do, we, how do we use that in, as a way to enhance learning? Uh, obviously, it's through online education and, and activities in that space. And then finally, it's really focusing on this interactivity. So the interactivity is one piece of, I think, many a, a spider web of, of interactions in um, sort of conceptual theory about, about learning, which I'm, I'm still learning about. So uh, interactivity um, can mean many things, right? It, uh, I'm going to be focusing on video interactivity today, but uh, I used to instruct an introductory geography class in physical geography. And I actually had a graduate student who did a um, survey of students about which, the, which of the labs uh, in that course were um, ones that the students liked the most. And it turns out it was the ones that were the stream table experiments, so the ones where students were actually working with materials and physical materials, and not the ones where they were just on the computer that, that the students really preferred. And, and so we started to think about, OK, manipulation, having that physical experience and interactivity is really important um, for this laboratory experience. That was one of my first kind of windows into, into this world. Um, in, in the literature, we understand that visualization means many things. It means an enlarged scope of, of action in processing. It means that it's useful to uh, talk about places that students can't actually get to. So when you're talking about history, you can't take them on a field trip. But you can share a video about that history. Uh, similarly, when I'm talking about climate change, it's hard to think about what that future is or what it looks like. So you have to use a different way of communicating. You can't interact with that physical world right now. So how do we, how do we get that interaction? Um, it also refers to scale. So uh, when I think about global dynamics and I'm in a geography program, I'm thinking about how to take students to other places that they couldn't otherwise go. So the way to take them to South Africa, even if we're sitting in a classroom or if they're sitting in a computer in China, how do you get them to go to these places and to travel virtually? Um, in areas of biology and other, other places as well, they're using it for nanoscale exploration, where you can't dive in to find enough scales to really understand dynamics. But if you could get into the, the chromosome of our DNA and actually look at the visualization of that, you can start to enhance learning. So there's lots of ways in which interactivity can cut across scales. Um, that, that is particularly attractive to me. 
it also enables uh, storytelling in a way that can be more emotive and episodic. And what I mean by that is it can connect to emotions in, a, in perhaps a more meaningful way because it allows students to access that material not just through a voice but through visual cues and auditory cues as well. Um, and it can be episodic. Uh, you can go through um, periods of, of um, temporal scales that are, that are not necessarily sequential, so you can connect storytelling in a more um, interesting way. Now, when I talk about interaction in visualization, um, again, literature has, has mentioned that there are many ways in which uh, that can manifest. One of them is this micro-level activities, the idea that a student can pace their learning in a way uh, that was not directly guided by the instructor. So outside of that instructor interaction, they can work through the material at their own pace. Um, at the macro scale, there's ideas that it can enhance nonlinearity in learning. So it's like if you're flipping through a book, you might want to, like, where am I in this? Like, where's chapter 15? Oh, I have three, three more pages to go. And then you can go back to where you, where you are. And so there's actually kind of an interesting connection um, between reading and, and the use of video in this and being able to manipulate the material uh, in a nonlinear way. There is, of course, lots of work in the gaming community on interactive videos, as my 12-year-old son would tell you. Um, and that it's that idea of feeling like you're in that space, this embeddedness, uh, and the player positioning and all of this. So there's a whole community of, of learning in that space, which um, I hazard to walk too deeply into. But, but it, it is worth realizing how much has been learned through that, through that space. Um, but overall, there's been very little assessment about how this interactivity has enhanced learning per se. Um, and so that was one of our, our goals as well in the COIL project that I'll talk about. Um, specifically for our project, we were really interested in providing online content that was educationally rich, flexible, tractable, but that also allows students to um, uh, access material that they might be more familiar with. Again, having you know older children in the house, I know that students are working through video content and touching their screen all the time, and that's how they're learning. So Getting ahead of that curve in the online environment seems like a, a good idea. Um, I also, because this is coming from my uh, research perspective, I'm really interested in how to have students um, learn how to think about what I'm calling wicked environmental problems, problems that are really tough and they're not, uh, you know, one in and out kind of problem. You don't, you can't just connect the dots by learning one subject anymore. You actually have to learn across many different domains of inquiry. Um, in order to try to come up with a solution. So if we really want to train students that are problem solvers, we have to learn to how to teach them to engage in that space. And, and um, that means having them think in nonlinear ways. It means having them create uh, I, models of complex systems. And you'll see how I uh, uh, try to address that here. And then um, obviously we're building on the study abroad program and some of my research in coupled natural human systems and this complexity theory in science and then also working with this emergent online and blended course at Penn State and um, in the Department of Geography we're really interested in getting general education courses that attract students um, to our to our program specifically but I know that's a mission across the university is how do we re-engage um, in a general education course in, in, with attractive content. So that, that was one of, our, one of our missions as well. So the study abroad program is called Parks and People. It's a 10-week immersive experience in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And I was one of several faculty who led parts of that program with students um, for a portion of that time for about three to four years. And since then, I have continued on with research in that area, my Fulbright program was also embedded in that area. So I've kept kind of connected with that program in various ways. They're out there right now. I think they're finishing up their last week or two in the program right now. So it's been going on for about seven or eight years total now at this point. Um, in my portion of the program, uh, I was looking for a research project which students, in which students could engage uh, quite simply. I, I didn't have a lot of ability to bring technical equipment over there or anything. So uh, given my interest, I wanted to get them in the forest have them start to study um, the trees, um, have them learn a little bit about soils. Um, and so I had them begin a, a carbon monitoring project, and they would just go out and measure tree uh, girth. And, and then over time, I've been able to look at productivity estimates in these forests, which scientifically is, is um, important. 
uh, but it was also an opportunity to get them to go into the, a nature reserve in this part of the Eastern Cape, um, which is co-managed in a post-apartheid land management restitution arrangement. So it's co-managed between the Provincial Parks Board and the communities that surround the reserve. Access to the reserve by the communities is limited. They can get in there for certain reasons, but not for others. And so there's a, there is a lot of tension there in terms of how this um, reserve is going to be managed. And so as we, um, we start to walk through this forest and start to learn more about it, and here I am with one of the park rangers, we have to identify what trees are there. And so I can identify them by the Latin name. I can identify them by their common name. Um, but we also started to identify them by the local name, by the Doncosa name. And so you start to see, um, learn a little bit more about the importance of those species to the local culture. So quickly this evolves from uh, a study where you're just looking at carbon storage because you under, want to understand climate change to a study where we're understanding medicinal plant uses in a forest in a post-apartheid you know, conservation region. So it becomes complex really, really quick. And you can see here the background is actually that forested area, the reserve, but the foreground is all the communities. So a very different land use. And as you start to think about this at the landscape scale, um, I'm a landscape ecologist, uh, you start to think about, oh wow, this is a really complex system. And as students were engaging in that system, we started to realize that there are these learning spaces that were, were being created. That they, there was a whole, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, there was a, a self-discovery, an uprooting, a consciousness raising. They were thinking about tolerance and respect. They were thinking about power, you know, what it means to be American in that space. Um, they were thinking about resistance, diversity, adaptation, all of these things. Where All of this was happening in the student's mind while they were in this place. And um, doing some work with Petra Chuckert, who was one of the other faculty members, she's since departed from Penn State, but um, she and I were trying to think about what, what was really happening in these learning spaces. And we realized that, um, and I know this is kind of complex image here, but we have students uh, in this class that were perceiving, thinking, attending to what was happening. We also had people that they were interacting with on the ground, stakeholders in the region. And you know, these people were also perceiving, thinking, attending. And, and yet it was this conversation space where interesting things were happening, where there was dialogue, where they were starting to engage more richly. And all of that was you know, part of the education piece. But we were also trying to do engaged scholarship. We are also there to do a service end of that. And then it became down here that what, what's been called third person organizing, which is assessing, performing, strategizing, revisioning. Lots of words here, right? But the key is that something was going on internally, something was going on in the, in the interaction with individual people, but then there was something larger that was happening in terms of service and outreach. Um, and in our case, what that if, uh, evolved into was uh, exercise and storytelling. And we, Carla Zembelsall over in education is also working very much in this space still, um, working with schools, uh, evolving, using stories through which um, the American students could engage with, with K-12 students in that area. Um, we actually, in one of our years, brought videos over there. And actually, you see a, a local child interacting with videos. And this is very early on in, in, our, in our space. Um, so there was a storytelling theme that was coming in through our, through our service learning. OK, flipping out to the, the science bit here, um, I was also thinking about this work in the sense of coupled natural human systems. And again, there's a whole literature on this, which we're not going to go into, but complex system science, socioecological systems, resilience. Um, all of this is to say that there are things going on in the physical system, you know, the forest I was interested in. But there was all these other things going on in the human system, in terms of the management and the communities and so forth. And it was this link between those two that is most rich. Uh, and that's what I mean about these wicked problems, right? If you don't understand those linkages and that interdisciplinarity across that space, you won't really understand the system as a whole. And so we started to have the students think about the system in that way and have them write, you know, go, going from a simple graph like this, human system, ecosystem, to actually thinking about, and this is an actual product, product that a student pro, from a student project in the Parks and People program, where he said, OK, that landscape, what are all the little parts of that landscape? And where are all the little connections? And look how complex it is, guys. Look how much they got from just being in that space and seeing that complexity and realizing all these things were interacting. So to me, that's just fantastic that students were starting to like realize the complexity of the system. That's the first step, of course, towards finding solution, but it's a really important step. So we, we also, this is, now I'm jumping geographies here, but we were using this approach in a completely different project. 
Um, this is a, a sorry for the visual down there. <laughs> um, this is a, a health issue. It's an emerging tropical disease called Beruli ulcer, caused by a bacterium called Mycobacterium ulcerans. And we received funding from the National Science Foundation through their coupled natural human systems program to explore the emergence of this disease. And we hypothesized that it was due to a combination of physical and, and social factors. And so um, in that space, and this is going on at the same time, I was also doing a study abroad work in South Africa. Um, and this is the original um, purposely small font <laughs> sized uh, graph of how we hypothesized the interactions were in a you know, formal science grant that was going to NSF that actually did get funded um, about what was going on in that system. And the only key things I'll point out is that there's ecological, economic, sociocultural dynamics across scales, local, landscape, regional. And then there are some thresholds going on. That's what we hypothesized. Um, and so we, uh, one aspect of the actual science that we did was to use remote sensing to look at land use change. And this image here is a, a land use change map. This is one of the main rivers along which we were working and all these, these areas of communities in which we were working. And most of these areas here in the brown and red are actual um, gold mining activities where they were doing a lot of gold mining in the area. So we're documenting some of the, the, the big land use changes that were happening in this region that we thought were connected to um, the, the, health, um, the emergence of this health uh, threat. We were also working in the communities, doing community mapping, surveys, and so on. So we were kind of embodying this idea of a complex system through our, through our methodology. We did environmental sampling of water. And we basically, you know, we reduced the complexity from all of this to where we are right now, which is sort of getting a better understanding, you know, through where these thick lines are of what the key dynamics are in the system. Okay? So this is a couple natural human systems work in practice at the high levels of science. But similarly to training students in a study abroad program, we wanted to have a service and engaged scholarship component. So we actually had teacher workshops on how to, uh, how these teachers, these are all teachers from local schools in Ghana, I, I probably didn't mention that we're actually working in Ghana, um, how they could actually bring complex system science to their education in Ghana. So they would be teaching complex system science to students in Ghana. And we were working with teachers from Penns Valley School here locally and the Center for um, Science in the Schools with Anne Marie Ward and others to try to develop modules that could be used in Penns Valley and could be used in Ghana about complex system science. And so we did that, and there is an, an, a set of modules that, that currently exist to teach that. Interestingly, um, we didn't realize we were being watched by, <laughs> by Anne Marie Ward, and actually we sort of did, uh, Leah Bug and, and others. But they were watching how we as researchers were approaching the system and how we were de devising the science about complex systems. So Amory and others created this master framework of how you ask questions scientifically. You have an overarching research question, you have major research questions, you have sub-research questions. And they started to observe how we were thinking as scientists about, about the problem. And, um, and I'm just sort of quickly going over this master model of complex system science. And so, you know, as I'm starting to think about all these pieces, I know that was a lot, but I, if you try to organize it, essentially what we were thinking about is that we were creating learning spaces for these students where they were getting first-person awareness, we're taking them to South Africa, creating these learning spaces. Um, we then were, through these learning cycles and storytelling, having these conversations about that space. And the storytelling comes in in that, in that mode. But then we are moving on to this third-person organizing where we're getting coupled systems and master model or sort of more abstract thinking about what we were doing. So we're kind of, there's this continuum uh, that we're going through. Uh, and you could also look at it this way, that at the finer scales, we're doing active listening. Then we're trying to create a narrative about that. And then we're doing some sort of relational thinking about that narrative. And then we're doing abstract thinking about that. So, you know, it's kind of fun to think about, okay, well, I'm just doing it because it's the science. I'm just doing it because it's a study abroad program. But when you abstract what the process really was, um, you realize that there are many layers of that, of that approach. So, but here's the problem. It was, this was all happening in Africa. And I was still teaching my introductory classes at Penn State. And I was thinking, gosh, I would love to bring this experience to the many more students that I interact with on a daily basis at Penn State. So I uh, started a residential course called Global Parks and Sustainability in which we started to talk about conservation in a global context. 
And I had interactive tools, you know, students actually creating a conservation area and thinking about these complex systems. And it went pretty well. Um, I'm actually going to read these. These are comments from the SRTEs of what students said. What I liked is that it really brought the question of how do we reconcile somewhat idealist principles with pragmatic management strategies to the forefront. I think that I was expecting to see a bunch of pictures of national parks and learn some quick general facts. The class ended up being much more than that and in a good way for the most part. Some honesty there. The class <laughs> challenged us to understand a national park not only as a place but as a complex landscape that includes history, ecology, society, and the conservation. Historically, many of these parks are blood-ridden and were claimed unjustly, scarring the integrity of the landscape. Adding to this the many other social injustices that still plague the notion of these parks as being truly invaluable acts of conservation, I have an internal dilemma of the true value of national parks and society. On the other hand, national parks are so much a part of the national identity and culture, where many people behind the scenes work so hard to conserve and preserve ecologically sensitive and attractive landscapes for the sake of future generations. My view on national parks has changed drastically. Right? That's great. That's the kind of thinking that you want them to challenge themselves with. And this is just a zero level class. So we were encouraged by that in general. And this got us the opportunity to seek some funding originally from the Sustainability Institute, but then further buoyed by the COIL grant to try to bring these experiences that I was seeing the, the students in South Africa were having into the classroom. We said, why don't we film the actual students in South Africa and bring it to the classroom for the students at Penn State? And so WPSU came out and, and did that with us. They helped film uh, the experience in South Africa. And I'll show you how we added interactivity to that in, in a minute. Um, and so then there was this phase. So first, if phase one was teaching it in the resident class, okay, phase two, oops, sorry, was actually creating the video production and getting funding to actually create the content. Then phase three became, okay, more than just watch video, could we actually have them interact with video? And that's really where the COIL grant was important because it allowed us to further work with the, the technical designers at, um, at WPSU as well as at Dutton to imagine what we were, you know, how, to, how to add that interactivity. And the first, we came up with two approaches, and, and both of them are currently in use in the, in the class, um, Geography One, Global Parks and Sustainability. The first one I'll, I'll talk about first is this HAPYAC, uh, which is, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in a, more in a minute, and I'll, I'll try to go through some. If you have time, I'll, I'll show you how it works. Uh, but essentially, it's a video that runs through. It, it could be at any length. And we chose a very simple option at this point, which is that there are just questions that pop up as the students work through the video. And there are other things you can do with this. You can add, um, well, you can add chapters. You can, like any one of these little dash marks, for example, are where I've added some sort of content throughout the video. The students are not allowed to progress through the content until they have answered the questions that come up. So there's some accountability that they're actually watching the video, which was one of the key things as a teacher I was interested in. Like, are they actually watching the content? Um, and then this replaces a quiz that I would have given in, in Canvas. Okay, so they're, they're actually getting that assessment through the video itself. The second uh, piece that we did, and this is one I'm kind of more excited about, but still it's also the one that needs more development, is that we're trying to get at that complex systems idea through what we're calling tagging. So this is the video that was actually created by WPSU. And to it now, we've added some tags that were def defined by me um, that relate to themes in the video. So here we are talking about conservation in South Africa. We're talking about these complex systems. And we know that there are both social and ecological dynamics. And we know that there are issues that connect those socio-ecological dynamics. I was curious what the students were hearing while they were watching the video. So the idea is that they click on these as they're hearing that term come up or something makes them think of that term. And they actually have a marker where they see where they've clicked. So we have a, a timestamp essentially when they've clicked that certain keyword. Then they click on this button called generate map and it generates another page that pops up that has a certain um, dominance of each of the key themes that they have selected in those key categories of ecology or environmental ecology, social, and issues. They eventually take that into another application called bubble.us, which is just a free program where they can take those themes and actually create a concept map or a mental model of the video. 
Um, now, it would be nice if we could get the concept map to actually be a drag and play kind of thing within the video element. We just didn't quite have the, the time or funding to do that, but that's sort of the, the, the goal. So just a, a little bit more on each of those. Um, Hapyak, um, there's some pros and cons to it. Uh, you can add any video through a URL. Some of them I've used have been available through YouTube or, or other kind of educational resources. Some of them we've produced ourselves. Any of those would be fine. Um, you can add chapters, overlay text, you can add images, and then quiz questions, which I did, and there are many choices of quiz que questions that you can use. Um, you have hotspots in the video, you can have buttons. For us, there was some privacy concerns. Because Hapiak is housed not at Penn State, we had big concerns about that in the assessment bit. So right now, there's kind of a convoluted way that we've worked that out through Dutton, and we've um, it's fine, it just means I don't ever see the data in Hapiak, and it comes through a third party through Dutton, and then we get it kind of anonymously back to me. So we don't have a user ID associated um, off-site. So we've, we've worked around that, but it wasn't smooth initially. It's also not free, so there's a cost associated with it. Um, and so that, you know, obviously is a challenge for the sustainability of it. Now they do want to, as I understand, work in the educational space more, um, and there may be opportunities moving forward, but I don't think Penn State has a contract with them in general. There are others that I know the Dutton Institute is, is looking at, and others, and Stephanie knows a lot about this as well, um, about other platforms. H5P is one that we might be switching to because it is free <laughs> and um, is one that is more supported um, through the Dutton Institute. So we may switch from Happy Act to that. I'm less familiar with that, but I, I might be learning more really quickly. Um, and I'd be, I'd be curious about input by others uh, who might have more insight into these different applications. Um, so anyway, this is what I said already about the tagging video. I don't think I, I think I already said that, so I don't need to um, say any more. So how we actually implemented this, now this is phase four, um, uh, is in an online program. So as Stephanie mentioned, I was on a Fulbright last spring, and, um, and yet I was also still kind of required to teach for geography. <laughs> so my department head said, oh, why don't you teach the online class of this? So we, we, which was the goal anyway, was to get this class online. And I was ready to do that, I was excited to do that. So what we did is we, um, created 10 uh, regular video quizzes through Canvas. We had four of the Hapyak quizzes. We had this one tagging video assignment. And then we had other kind of regular videos, you know, not interactive videos that were interspersed in the online content. Okay, that's because we just wanted to do that. So we had all these different ways in which we were using video. Um, and in the course, in this online course, what we decided was that the tagging video would be used to train the students on what a concept map was, what a, how, what a mental model was, how you connect complex systems into a mental model. And we would work through many iterations. I think there's actually like five different steps to this process where they go from a simple com, um, concept map example to a more fully fleshed out one. And, and the goal here was that, I should have mentioned this, that the final project for, for the students' work is a video of a park somewhere in the world that they want to know more about that we haven't actually talked about in class. So they're supposed to take an issue from about this park, let's say it's the Grand Canyon and they're interested in flooding or something, and they would take that issue and they would create, do we need to, <laughs> they would create a, um, a mental model or concept map about that issue. And so that was a way for us to have them think about a complex system, but it also was a way for me to have that concept map be a video storyboard. So we're essentially having them create a video storyboard, but doing it through this complex systems mental model approach, which for me was two birds with one stone. Um, and so each one of those boxes and each one of those connection points was supposed to be something that they would be mentioning in their, in their final video project. So, um, Part of our COIL grant and part of our interest here was to assess all of those pieces. And so what we did was had different metrics available to us for that assessment. For HAPYAC, we had this length of viewing, how long they were watching the video. We had their seeking behavior, number of plays, user-specific answers. Now, not all of those did we end up using. Um, we still could, potentially, but um, we've used some of those. For the WPSU tagging, we had the number of views, number of times paused, number of maps generated, length of viewing, and which keywords were clicked by which student. 
So we had all sorts of data available to us. I have pretty low confidence that these are the best set of metrics <laughs> to use, to be honest with you, but this is what we had that was available. And it would be a useful exercise to think about, well, if we could develop an, other kinds of metrics, what would they be? Oh, and uh, sorry, we also had the um, student learning, what are those called? The SALG student assessment of learning gains, gains um, that we were using as well, so we had surveys. So based on those surveys, um, here are some general results. Uh, over half, um, well actually they were, so they were similar between the happy act and tagging, so I'm just going to kind of report one. But 75%, so three quarters of the students reported good or great gain in remembering the material. Over half reported great gains in keeping on track, and very few reported that they didn't have any gains. And this is relative to other, other uh, content. A majority reported moderate gains in their enthusiasm for the subject and confidence in being successful. And 35% had great gains in relating material to real world issues. Um, now 20%, I mean, you know, at first we were like, oh, it wasn't three quarters reporting that they wanted to major in geography. <laughs> but actually a, a bump of 10 or 20% in a gen ed class is actually pretty good, you know, when you think about it. Even if you only catch a handful of students, that's, that was a good result in some ways. Um, so we also, but we did look at grades too. We had grades of these students anonymously, so we could match the grades with some of those metrics. Um, the statistics that I've run so far shows that there is no difference between the grades that they were getting on, you know, per student on the traditional quizzes, the happy act quizzes, or the tagging video. So you can see that as good or bad. Um, I'll take it as good. It means there was no drop in, <laughs> in their, um, their grade. There was no difference in the way they were learning. But at the same time, how they were feeling about what they were learning was, was better. Um, so, that, so that's interesting. Um, and these are just graphical results of that same uh, aspect showing you a little more detail about some of the questions that we were asking and, and kudos to Stephanie who really helped us uh, pull that, that survey together. Uh, but moderate to great gains in almost all categories um, that we tested. You know, interest in subject here is where you know, very few um, had the likelihood uh, to pursue a, a, you know, a degree in geography, but still small percentages are not, not necessarily bad. Um, from the tagging, we found that the students would view the video 2.7 times on average, and they generated 3.9 maps per student. So that's showing that they're really kind of interacting with it quite, quite a lot. They paused the video an average of 17.6 times. That might just be because they went to the fridge. We don't know. <laughs> but but they're, they are using that nonlinearity. Um, student grades were not correlated with the, t that's the same that I just mentioned about the grades. Or, and they, yeah, they weren't correlated with the metrics themselves. So um, that, that was a sort of interesting result, and that's what I mean about the metrics not necessarily being the best ones, because those metrics didn't correlate with how well that student did on the, on the test, or on that video. Um, so I have to think more about that. But we, I, I think the most interesting result is that moving from, um, I should have mentioned, that in their concept map, the evolution of the concept map to video, they're doing this as a group project, but we start it out where the students are individually working on a concept map about their parkscape, and then it goes into a group project mode. So then all of them are working together on a collective concept model. So there's this evolution of the concept mapping through the course. And um, what we actually analyzed is as they're turning in these concept maps, we're able to do network metrics on these concept maps. So we have uh, folks over at Dutton who have the skills to, to actually assess that. And um, here are just some from previous work here uh, about different network structures that you could find. And it, you know, to me, I'm like, oh, it's a concept map. And here is the results from our actual work. So this is, this is a network metric. And here we have the individual concept map, the draft concept map, and the final concept map, and, the, and their sort of video score. What you're seeing here is that they, there's increasing complexity in their concept maps as they went through the exercise of concept mapping. So they're getting that greater complexity in the concept mapping as they're going through the course. Which remember, as I said originally in that Parks and People program, seeing that complexity is not the end game, but it is a really important thing for a gen ed class to have them being able to see, oh, there's all these dynamics going on, and to connect the dots. So I was really encouraged by this. And, and the fact that we could use network metrics to actually assess that from the concept maps. So that, that, that's, a, that's a tease for us. 
So the last time I doing on time. So the last thing I wanted to to mention is kind of what we're doing now and where we're going with that interactive video piece. And this also relates to yet another research project. And this is the use of virtual reality. Uh, so again, I'm teaching global parks and sustainability, but now I'm not teaching it resident. I'm not te teaching it online. I'm teaching it blended. So I'm getting the whole the whole <laughs> exposure here. Um, so that means I meet with them once a week, and I have this ability to interact with them. Uh, in addition to having them work through the online content. So all that other stuff stays the same. We still have the interactivity online with the videos. But now I'm bringing Google Cardboard viewers into the classroom. And I'm using Google Expeditions, Google Street View, and any other content that's available to me to have them virtually visit a national park or a, a conservation area in a different part of the world um, and, and work with them in that content. And Colleagues of mine, Alex Klippel, is leading a lot of this in the geography um, department, and he's now helping me add interactivity to that virtual reality experience. Um, we're just starting to do that now, but the idea is that you could click on a map and you can like have your viewer zoom in, and it will show it will pull up another image, and so you can basically zoom in to a map and have these images appear. And so that's really exciting. That's what we're we're working towards. Um, but I think there's a lot of uh, relationships to the interactivity that I've been talking about so far uh, because the, the way we've been talking about immersive virtual reality in the scientific world is that it, it is using storytelling. It's um, having this immersive experience or an embedded experience. Uh, it'll, and in our project, which I'm about to mention really briefly, is that it allows people to access this emotive experience. In our, in our case, we're really interested in what the values are. When people are walking through a forest or walking down a path, you know, what are they seeing? What are they valuing in that system? And can we use that to help us inform decision making? Um, and we are doing this, uh, this is actually through another NSF couple, Natural Human Systems Project, working with the Menominee Native American tribe, nation, in uh, northern Wisconsin. So here's, here's Green Bay, and this is the Menominee Reservation, as you can see outlined here. Um, and you can see that it's very forested relative to the outlying landscape. They have a very sustainable forest management program. Um, and it's phenomenal to see. Turns out they're very concerned about climate change threatening some of their sustainability principles. Um, worried about pests and pathogens, worrying about changes in climate. And they want to be proactive about it. They want to say, should we manage our forests differently um, to prepare for this? And so, uh, and this, actually, I don't really have time to go through this, but there's a, they have a sustainability model of the Menominee Nation that is interdisciplinary, <laughs> that does, is about the physical environment, but it's also about economics, human perception, land and sovereignty, institutions, technology, a really forward-looking sustainability model. So we wanted to use that, um, well, use that with them. They're, they're a collaborator and a co-PI on the project to help, to help frame the problem. And the, the problem is getting to the sustainable forage, forest management, but incorporating traditional ways of knowing and traditional knowledge about the system, ecological knowledge, um, to help us better inform their choices for future forest conditions. And so we're calling this project Visualizing Forest Futures. And again, I'm going to interest of time, unless you're interested, I can come back to this, but I just wanted to highlight that um, one key component of our project is this visualization of novel forest conditions um, in the future. So this gets back to this whole idea of visualization in the first place. Why would you do it? Well, because you want to know what the future forest is going to look like, but moreover, you want to know what it's going to feel like to those people. And some of our traditional Western science approaches, oh, you're going to have this tree species and that tree species, that might not really be the full picture. We want to understand what all stakeholders might feel about, well, there might be medicinal plants that are going to go away. Oh, this isn't the same forest that my forefathers had before me. You know, those are the values that would then go into a decision-making um, analytical space uh, that would help. But we want to access that through immersive virtual reality experiences. So the idea is that our stakeholders would actually wear the goggles or interact with that in some way. And those future forest conditions would be modeled um, in many different ways. And we're exploring the, the ways to do that right now. I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. And so we are, I decided why not bring that into the classroom. So these are some of the students in the, in the class this semester where we're using this Google Cardboard. And as I mentioned, we're using Google Expeditions and Street View and trying to um, 
explore explore the space of, of bring, bridging again the science where we're actually doing it in a research project but also bringing it into the classroom um, and and so on so I, I think this is my almost final slide two more slides uh, essentially all those little keywords that I had at the beginning with that arrow um, you know this is another way of looking at it we have this tagging and interactivity this active listening where a, a single person is engaging with a video but they're also doing this um, what I think is relational categorization or higher order thinking. We're asking them to categorize things. You know, so there, are all, there are all these topics that are up there and people know that these are all important, but let's think about them relationally to each other. Some of them are ecological, some are social, some are socio-ecological. And then we have them organize them in an abstract way through a concept map. And then we have them create a narrative through a video. So essentially in the learning environment, they're doing all the same things that we were doing kind of in the research environment as researchers, but now at the back end, the students are doing it and creating their own video. And so as I, you know, um, I was actually putting this talk together, I was realizing how, how beautifully packaged <laughs> this work was, and it wasn't, it wasn't all planned. Um, but I think that we as educators are trying to get through learning spaces, cycles, storytelling, coupled systems, abstract thought, and then we actually were kind of reversing it. Um, or at least having this backward spiral in the educational space where we're going from, at, or linking at least, the, these, these concepts in the educational environment as well. Um, so I, I think I'll end with that. I'm sure there's lots of questions, or um, if not, I can keep talking. But uh, I do want to acknowledge all the many funding sources that I, I mentioned here. Uh, there are two couple natural human systems awards, another um, award that allowed me to bring undergraduates into the into the forest. The Sustainability Institute was really critical in some of that initial work, um, as well as a Gladys Snyder grant from the College of EMS, the Fulbright, and then uh, pretty critically this, this COIL grant, which, which helped us package it all together. Well, thank, so thank you thank very you. much. We, we do have one question so far online. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask if we have any questions here in the room. Um, uh, uh, maybe, it, does anybody, we'll give it. Okay, Larry has a few questions. Um, you know what, Larry, I will say the first question that, that came in online does ask about the development process for tagging, and you had just mm. ended uh, with lots yeah. of information about the tagging, so maybe we'll start there yeah. with, it just plain says, could you address the development process for tagging? Right. So it was a process, and it was funded through the COIL grant, so it probably took 18 months or so to actually develop. Um, what we did is uh, went to WPSU and said, okay, what are your visualization skills? We, you know, we know that they're already doing visualization in a lot of their applications. And working with that team, we started to convey, okay, this concept mapping thing, which frankly, they had, you know, didn't really understand what I was trying to say as a researcher. Oh, it's all these elements connecting. And um, we, it took us probably six to nine months to, to get to the point where we were really talking about the same thing. And... And I said, well, I want them to kind of get at a concept map from a video. That was, that was what we had to kind of say. And then we talked about, okay, well, how do we do that? And um, I can't quite remember. I, I know there were a few phases of how we landed on this tagging idea. Um, I don't know if you remember. You were in some of those There meetings, were a lot of phases. There were a lot of phases. Like, um, there were some prototypes made of the programming. They, they're asking here about the development process for yeah. the tagging. So I'm assuming yeah. they're, they're thinking the programming. That's right. So and software. Yeah, for sure. There was definitely it was on the software end. What could they do mm -hmm. versus what my my dream was that they could do. Um, and then, but what's happened now is that now there is this code that um, technically should be transferable to other courses. So those keywords are ones that um, I placed there. My understanding is I haven't tried this yet, but I have the power now to manipulate those keywords in the code. It needs to be a little more user friendly, is my, mm -hmm. my sense of the process. Mm -hmm. But technically, I could do that, manipulate different keywords so that you could take another video, bring in another video, change the keywords, and have the tagging go to another video. There's no reason in, in now to do that. We yeah. have to close the loop with WPSU to kind of yeah. to, to get that out there again, but that's, that's the plan. So it's a nice outcome from the grant. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. I think it's a product. Thanks. Larry, then did so you I know have. Roy had a question uh, online. Did you... Yeah, I was going to. Jump in Dr. real quick. Uh, Roy online asked, uh, can we come see the video mapping way or, or maybe come to class and you can show us? Yes. And I mean, I could show now. I don't know if you want to do questions. I could get this show a little bit. 
while you're answering the I could try well, to get this um, up while my you're... question is actually kind of related to that so yeah. if you don't mind maybe sure. I'll throw mine out and see if we can do both so I will try to tell the story very quickly but I, I was recently at a talk at a conference where the um, presenter decided to use a bingo game technique you know so whenever you hear this word tag it and mm -hmm. then if you get them in this thing yell bingo okay, okay. And I, at first I thought, oh, this is kind of cool because this is going to draw me into the content. What I, what I found out was that it was a distractor yeah. because I'm paying attention to the word because mm -hmm. I want to win the, the game. Mm -hmm. And I didn't listen to any of the content. Yeah. So that, that was my question. Now, you made a, there was an interesting observation that two, they, the students watched it 2.7 times. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering mm -hmm. two thoughts. Mm -hmm. One is, would, a strategy, would another strategy be to, to require them? Watch the video completely through first yeah. time. Then second time around, you make the tagging available. And maybe instead of the tags being individual boxes where I've got to sort of hunt around yeah. and find them, I click on the video where I heard the term. It produces a drop-down menu. And those menus are organized by your structures or your categories, yeah. geography, social. Now I pick the tag I want. Now I continue to watch. I see the next one. I click on the video and so forth. So it's kind of embedded and it freezes the video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm not losing content while I'm hunting down for the tag. So I, I, I wondered if you'd thought that through or... We definitely... Okay, so I, I am remembering that one of the issues that we talked a lot about was how to, how to represent those tags in a way that was easy for the students to click and to okay. find the category. So like to, for the, should all the ecology ones be red and all the other ones mm. be orange so that they didn't have to hunt too hard. And we went yeah. through many iterations of that. I'm not even totally happy with the final product, I don't think. But um, so we did think about that in terms of ease of clicking and not wanting to be, it to be too distracting. Um, I think to your point of having them watch it through all the way once, I probably should do that um, and just tell them to do that first without, there's no reason they couldn't do that. I don't think we have to do anything on the technological side. I could just tell them to watch it once and then the second time to tag it. There's no penalty for them to do that. Um, I, I think the back end of creating the concept map forces them to make sure they understand the video. So the keyword tagging just gets it to this one place, but then to create that relational organization around the topics, they do have to have heard the video and the story and the narrative. So we're connecting it in that way. But I, I appreciate the, the thought because I, I agree that there would be better ways of, of doing that as, we're, as they're watching the video. That, that would, I, I think that's a good way that we should move forward with that. What, what I should ask was my first question is, when do you offer the class next? Because I want to take it. <laughs> this is marvelous, marvelous stuff. I just loved it. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I don't know. Next spring. <laughs> next spring. Um, yeah, I could just take you through really quick. Um, this is... Where are we? Yeah, this is uh, one of the Happy Act videos. Um, this is actually um, about Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. And it's created not by us, obviously, as you can see there. And I'm actually just going to go through it pretty quick so we can get to some of the content. When I was a child, I wouldn't think that the mountain would change when it did. I was thinking that this is an everlasting life. So at any point you can see these chapters and they could jump to different sections in the course that I've created. This is Gorongosa National Park. And this I this is a map that I embedded over the video or that one could embed over the My video. My dream is to be a tour guide in the park in the future. Um, I'm just gonna try to find one of the questions actually. They killed them all of them. So this is about poaching in the park. But now they're starting coming back. And right here, there's a question. What was the cause of the wildlife decline in Gorongosa that started in 1977? And to answer that, then they would, they've just heard that it was a, as a result of, of civil war. And so I would then click, I'd click that, you submit it, um, and then you continue. Now, there's new hope. And it's pretty Gorongosa. simple like that. And I so just we're working have with to... The um, government. I just have to create those questions, and I do that within the Happy Act site itself. So you actually get an account through Happy Act, and I guess I'm not taking you there right now, but you would log in, and then you upload your video to Happy Act, and there's a whole other platform where you are able to, to modify and add questions to that. So that's that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at your mic. <laughs> if you get the answer incorrect, um, you can keep moving on. There's a place where it says that answer was incorrect and I can add comment about 
each of the incorrect answers that also would pop up. So sorry, that answer wasn't right. It was actually the Civil War that caused the decline. So you give some feedback to the student before they progress. Um, and there are lots of options, I believe, for um, having that count or not count, like do you want them to retake the question or not, you can you can modify it. I because I'm doing this as an assessment, I have the, that count as a negative score. Or, you know, they don't get credit for that question and then they move on, but they still move on. Does that um, so would they not repeat that kind of like segment again? They can't go back. You have to go all the way through and we give them instructions there. Um, you need to watch the video completely and wait for the questions to pop up. Um, the questions will be graded automatically and associated with your user ID, but they will not appear, and that's where they won't appear in your gradebook immediately because then it, the happy act is what's recording right, okay. their answers. I should know if it was a case of like uh, them being distracted from the, the content mm -hmm. for just like for whatever reason, yeah. and then just like missing that, that key. Tag. Oh, can they go back before they... If, if it sends um, you... I don't think they can. I don't think they can on that. I can't quite remember, actually. So a lot of these types of tools will allow the instructor lots of different options. latitude in terms of where, how they set it, whether they can go forward or not, whether they can answer twice, whether yeah. they can review the piece and then answer right. again. So there's a lot of control on the instructor's part in terms of just how uh, stringent they want to make it in terms of it being either practice or an exam. I haven't heard any complaints from students on that, having run it now twice, about that <clears throat> aspect of it. So that doesn't seem to be bothering them. However, I have it set up, I'll have to go review that. I would also share that this shows it's the 34 minute, 31 second video. The instructor also has the ability to chunk it into smaller chunks. Yeah. So yeah. it could be seven minutes this time, eight minutes the next, which makes it easier to go all the way through and then come back and maybe mm -hmm. allow them to redo it after they've mm -hmm. done it one time. Right. It just kind of seems to me that this is more of like you're being tested on your <clears throat> how well you can take in information and you regarding the video and yeah. not actually about what is learning and sticking in your mind. Well, so the alternative is <laughs> that, no, I see what you're saying. I mean, absolutely. Um, the other thing is you're, you're they're watching or not watching the video. So a lot of this is accountability mm -hmm. that they're yeah. actually watching the video and less, less on, um, I mean, the content, I use this content then to talk about broader themes within the rest of the, the lesson. It's not only the video that's there. So this video is embedded within a lot of written material. So there's context for this, and then there's learning review at the end and, and so forth. It's not in a vacuum. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's right. certainly a, an issue with, with some of this. And I think that's one of the challenges is how to make sure that it's not, you know, they just are not uh, getting getting to each question, jumping ahead to each question, and then answering it. I found that mm. students don't do well if they do that. If they just, like if they like what I was just doing, like clicking to each question, yeah. they don't actually do very well, mm -hmm. you know, and they, don't, they can't speed through it. But if they take the time to watch the video, they do well. <clears throat> so we can usually right. tell which students are actually watching yeah. the video. Yeah. So I just want to say there's a note now online that we have about five minutes remaining if there are other questions in the, in the room here. If you have a question, okay, I'll pass the mic then. Unless there was any follow-up, you good? Okay. <laughs> I just was curious about the um, storytelling aspect and the concept mapping. Yeah. How how much do you think um, those two really support each other? Um, have you really felt, wow, you know, without the concept mapping, the digital storytelling aspect would be so much different? No, I think, I mean, there's clearly many ways in which they could do a video story, you know, that they would do a more traditional um, uh, storyboard for their video. I mean, absolutely. And it'd be a lot simpler if I did that, probably. <laughs> um, but it was the connection between socio and ecological systems that I really wanted them to get at, that interdisciplinarity. And I, I know that they can create many stories about the problems in their park, but I wanted to get them to think non-linearly non about the solutions as well. And I, I couldn't imagine how to do that without having them embrace the systems approach. Um, so they could create a video story about, hey, there's poaching in Gorongosa, and this is the issues and stuff. But I, I, couldn't, in, I couldn't imagine how to teach them about that complexity and having, making sure that their complexity was in their storyboard. I mean, I could have them create a storyboard, and then I could say, oh, that's wrong. You need to have these other elements here, here, and here, and here. 
but why not just do that at the front end and have have that mapped out already so you know that where these different pieces fit in in the in the full picture i'm sure there's other ways of doing it probably if there's simpler ways i'd probably be happy to hear that <laughs> i just think that's a really valuable that's wonderful for me to hear that okay. um, because the concept mapping i think is a piece that when i've been working with the digital storytelling mm -hmm. that we do the storyboard but that concept mapping piece and that interdisciplinary mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. that's really interesting and I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that today great it's a good idea great thank, thank you. you thank you online we have a question uh, from Dan asking is this content accessible uh, to, uh, to students uh, you mean accessible for individuals that and they have hearing needs. or special yeah, needs. Yeah, right. So we, the, the Happy Act is, and that's the reason we're using it. Um, we were able to use that, and that's the reason we're not using H, mm. HP, H5, whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> H5B, mm -hmm. um, yet, because it didn't fully uh, address all the accessibility issues for students. Um, so we've got this cost issue or the accessibility. So that's, that's why we haven't flipped to the free software yet, mm -hmm. but Dutton is working on that, and they're trying to, to fix the accessibility issues. But right now, all the content is. And we have it fully captioned and everything. So good question. So I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you were talking with the, uh, the lady over here about um, the, kind of like the, the storytelling and mm -hmm. uh, how you wanted students to kind of like think in a non-linear -lin kind of a mm -hmm. progression. Uh, my question is, does the video, the way that the students are asked questions, does that progress in a linear fashion? Or are there questions where if they get like a particular answer, it could jump to another? We wanted to do the jumping and the right. branching. Actually, the branching was the idea that I was most excited about, where uh, students could actually get into a video and then they it would branch into another storyline, and even based on their choice. Like, do you want to hear more mm. about poaching? Or do you want to hear more about climate change? Yeah, and yeah. there would be branching. We didn't have the time to put that in here, but that is definitely a hot area of research possible. in interactive yeah. video, and it is possible. It wasn't possible easily with HAPYAC. Uh, at least it, we couldn't figure out yeah. how to do it easily. Um, but other applications are coming online, at least reporting yeah, yeah. that they can. And I think that's that, but that gets you really into the gaming world pretty quickly, <clears> into uh, a yeah. lot of the gaming software has that. You know, which character do you want to be, and how do you want to like live this life? And, and you can then... Um, so that, that is actually where learning from the gaming community might be useful, mm. I, I think, but others may know more. Thank you. So we did have one last question online, um, and it might be a relatively easy one to answer. Um, Adam asks, is the concept map more summative at the end of the unit while the model choice questions in the videos are merely formative? Well, I wouldn't say that the concept map, I'm, I'm not treating the concept map as summative in the sense that it is an evolving uh, learning mm -hmm. element. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a tool that we use throughout the course. Yes, it does uh, get you to that abstract thinking bit of about a problem. So mm -hmm. it, I guess in that sense, it's summative. Uh, but in the way I'm using it in the course, we're summing many times. <laughs> and then that, that product is evolving. Uh, but yes, the, the, I think, if I understand the question correctly, most of the, the questions in the video are very much on content. Mm -hmm. Uh, at this point, but that's where the tagging video is not. So the happy act ones are, you know, content. Are you paying attention? Are you listening to the video? Um, sort of that like uh, stick <laughs> kind of approach. And then this one is more of of getting at having the students individually um, have that learning emerge sure. yep. in, uh, through through the concept mapping. And as the instructor, you can kind of set that up whichever way you prefer. You, you can decide whether you want to use these tools as formative yes. and then others as summative. And yes. Now, I mean, the main issue that we're actually not talking about is the fact is the content, like having material um, in which I could embrace socioecological themes and have this tagging. Like a lot of, I'd have to have the right content to be able to attach that kind of thinking mm -hmm. and and. You know, we had the opportunity to create our own video in this, so we, I knew what was in there, and I, I designed it with the producer to try to get at those themes, and I knew which themes we wanted to talk about. Uh, but not all video is like that, <laughs> and so it's very hard. It would be hard to package yeah. all videos. So, so finding the like, right video or yeah, creating the right video and especially becomes, that's true with the virtual reality world. Sure. We're just missing content. Like I just don't have the right. You know, the cameras aren't out there collecting the the video yeah. content. That's why I can't use it more. Well, thank you so much, Erica. We really appreciate all of your thank insights. You.
Thank you. Uh, any other last comments? I'm sure you'll be sent to survey. Great stuff. I mean, really, this is really exciting. Cool. This, is so, this is so rich, I think, for further research and exploration and all, but just a wonderful grasp of these uh, pedagogical approaches and, and trying to figure out which ones are making the difference. Yeah, so thank right. you. Thank all you right. for sharing thank it with us much. today.